Hello, everybody. James here, WSI, my first guest of the spring, and he's got a new book out. I'm going to show it to you right now. Here we go. The Kern Chronicles, Volume 1, so there's going to be more out there as well. I've read through it. Thoroughly enjoyable book, co-authored by Ian Douglas. Now, to the intro. Done it all in his career. He was a fabulous one, an alligator hunter, and even one of the doinks at one point. He's one of the legends of the territories in America, in Japan. He's even been in England quite a few times, you just told me as well. Steve Kern. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning to you. Good morning, James. Good morning to everybody listening and watching. Hey, there's going to be a lot watching and listening, so don't you worry. We're going to be plugging the book for all it's worth as well. We're going to really get it out there, so you just leave that to me. And as I'm actually just looking at the script here, covering the early parts of your career in professional wrestling, plenty of non-wrestling stories in the book as well. Very interesting about your father being a POW for years as well. That's I won't even ruin that for people to uh, read that. We're going to be talking about the wrestling mostly. But I know you dedicated the book uh, to somebody you really, really care about. I've written a couple of books as well, and you only dedicate a book to somebody you really care about and really respect, and you dedicate the book to Jack Briscoe. Why Jack? Well, Jack, <clears throat> Jack was like my mentor. He was one of them. I mean, you know, when you started in this territory here, Florida, Basically, this was an opportunity for people to come from all over the world that were in the wrestling business and work, and they would utilize it as almost like a vacation. So all the top talent came through here, even though they didn't stay here all the time in Florida. So you had an opportunity to rub shoulders with them. Well, Jack was here quite a bit. And he was, a to me, he was a stud. I mean, you know, if I was going to pattern myself after anybody at that time in that era, it was going to be Jack Briscoe. I mean, you know, he had, he had a great physique, but he wasn't a big bodybuilder kind of a guy. He was an athlete. He had a great background, which you can't all of a sudden, you know, create. But at the same time, it gives them credentials and reality so far as, you know, being able to handle himself in the ring. And then as a person, he was willing to share. And when he shared, he shared really things that were important to me because it, you get a lot of stuff. In, in your brain when you first start into this industry with what's right, what's wrong, what should I be doing, how, how should I do it, all of these different things. And you have, there was a tendency for guys to mislead you. And I don't know if that was purposely to send you down the wrong track to keep you out of their, out of their way. But at the same time, as I developed through my career, Jack had put so much into me in time and all of the things that he taught me Actually, I utilized over time periods, which I didn't even sometimes at the very beginning when he explained it to me, I was kind of like it was way over my head. I mean, being a brand new kid in the wrestling business, it was like I was a minnow in a sea of sharks. And, you know, people don't understand that have never been in this industry. But one of the most important parts of being in the wrestling business is being able to get along. I mean, you know, that dressing room time and psychology is so vital and so important. I mean, you know, I used to, as I taught, I would teach guys. I said, hey, this is simple to me. Would you rather everybody likes you in that dressing room or would you ever or would you rather they were like afraid of you? And most of them would say, well, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you what you want. You want them to like you because they're going to be handling your body out there. <laughs> they have the one option is the most misused phrase in professional wrestling is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because that's all they can say to you when they hurt you. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, you, when you've been kicked too hard in the head or in the gut or whatever and you look at the guy and go, oh, man, and they go, oh, man, I'm sorry. What else can you ask of them? So that's the most misused phrase. But Jack was so essential in my career because it, he gave me insights, insights. And really, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. You don't just start and all of a sudden you're great. You have to develop over experience and time. And basically what you find is, is some people will lead you, like I said, you know, on a stray and the other people will shoot straight with you the whole time. And only common sense going into your mind is what tells you, okay, well, that made sense. I mean, I had a lot of old timers tell me things to do and I'd look at them and I'd just shake my head. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. When I walk away from them, I'm going, there's no way 
I'm ever going to do that. <laughs> and it's because that, that was really stupid. But Jack was the kind of guy that would say, hey, listen, this is what you do, kid. You go out and watch every match. You're in the beginning. Go out and see what the main event's doing. Go out and watch the first to the last match and see how the guys get over. See what they do to entertain the audience. See what they do to tell their story. And in those times, it was storytelling. It's different from nowadays. Wrestling has changed. It's a wheel that's going forward. So you can't reverse it. But what it, what it was back then was you had average 20 minutes a night in your match instead of six. And you had to go out in front of an audience that is seeing you 52 times a year every week you're in that same town so they're seeing you repeatedly and you had to be different but you had to tell a story good versus evil and realistically take them on an emotional roller coaster of up and down until you really hooked them to the point where they were regardless of whether they thought it was real or if they thought it was predetermined they were into it and they're yelling and screaming so Jack was a vital part of my career. Well, there's a story I've heard about Jack, and for the life of me, I can't remember who told me. But the story was is that, obviously, Jack was a real stud at amateur wrestling, and some fan had pushed him too far one night. And after years of being in the business, he'd never attacked a fan. And then one day, this fan did whatever it was, and instead of wrestling, uh, Jack ended up just tuning this guy one punch and knocked him out clean. And everyone was looking at Jack and saying, after all your wrestling credentials, the first time you get in a fight with a fan, you hit them. <laughs> I was I was there. Oh tell, oh, tell me the story then. It was in Georgia. I mean, you know, it was in Georgia, and I want to say Savannah, Georgia. And it sounds like the story I've always told, so I don't think we've talked before, but maybe you've heard it. But anyway, being a big, you know, admirer of J Jacks and everything, what the guy did, was we were standing in an area watching the matches. And I was standing right beside Jack, and a guy comes up to Jack, and he goes, he says to Jack, he says, hey, man, how do you get in this shit? <laughs> and Jack, Jack looks at him, and he goes, what are you talking about? He said, well, I want to be one of you guys. How do you get in this? And Jack says, well, I guess you challenge a wrestler or whatever, and, you know, if you can beat him, maybe you get an opportunity. So the guy looks at Jack. He says, well, I'm challenging you. And, oh, my God, my heart just lit up. I'm going, <laughs> you know, here's my, here's my hero who has stretched me time and time again, and now I'm going to watch him take this guy down, go behind, drive his face in the dirt and all this. And then all of a sudden, invited the guy back in the back, and we went back behind where the curtain was, and they, he turned around, and the guy was looking at him, says, well, what do we do? And he says, we fight, and Jack threw a big punch, and it was on him, and boom, boom, and it was over. And I was so let down. I, said, <laughs> I was so let down. Ole Anderson come around the corner, and Ole Anderson said, what happened? I said, a guy just challenged Jack. And I said, but, but, but he didn't do a wrestling move. He didn't do a fireman carry. He didn't do anything that, you know, he just punched him out. And Jack was left-handed. And there's a thing to being left-handed because there's not a lot of guys that are left-handed. And when you're in this business, you want to know everybody that's left-handed. Because when they say they're getting ready to punch you, you don't want to turn your face the wrong way. Because it all of a sudden, I was thinking you had, you were right-handed. And I turned right into that one. So Jack being left-handed, he drilled him and, down and on the way down he followed him and that was the end of it and i was i was expecting some big moves and you may be even a suplex on the concrete but didn't happen that's not the way it happened so <laughs> i love anyway. how, i love how like a live knockout could be a disappointment just depending on <laughs> depending off if it was jack uh, i would well it taught me a lesson it taught me that you know it's not about it's not about how you win the fight it's about winning the fight People don't ask you, well, did you cheat to win? Uh, well, what do you call cheating? I didn't want to get hurt, so I won. Okay, well, did you sucker punch him? Well, yeah, I've learned to be the first one to throw the punch. That's usually the winner if you get the good punch in. But if it's not, 
you're in you're in trouble so anyway <laughs> uh, i encourage people as well there's a good few fight stories in the book as well steve's book i want yeah. to also ask uh one of the two forwards was written by cm punk which i found really surprising i hadn't realized that i realized that you've gone to ovw were you just going there as right. like a guest trainer at times or just like on a day-by-day basis or were you there full-time training the guys at any point No, I just went in as kind of a scout. I was an agent at the time. They later changed the title from agent to producer. But when I started for Vince, I was doing an agent job where I was, you know, in charge of talent. And they would send us to OVW and sometimes to other guys' schools, um, like up in New Jersey, where we found Kofi Kingston and, and a couple other places. We'd go look at the talent and then we'd do kind of seminars for him because I started teaching in 1981. My first student was Tracy Smothers. And so I'd already developed an idea that I wanted to follow up on teaching and share my knowledge with you know, younger people and at least give them some kind of insight. So before, that's how that got started. Before I forget, right. So uh, we've got another mutual friend as well in Don Morocco. And I used to do a, po- a podcast with Don Morocco uh, a year or two right. ago. How could you do Don like that? He came in as the magnificent M, and you took his mask off. How could you do Don like that? Well, here's the thing. (laughs) I'm not in charge of anything I do once I walk through the curtain. I've been preloaded like a gun. Somebody's told me exactly what they want, exactly how long they want it, and what the outcome needs to be. That's the thing understand. Even when wrestling fans think they're so in tune with what's going on, they'll turn right around and say, well, you never won any titles when you did Skinner or something like that. And I'm looking at them and I'm going, I wasn't in charge. I just did what I was told. You get paid like any other job to do what you're told and nothing else. Don't get creative out there and decide, you know what? That didn't really sound like a good idea, pulling Don's mask off. So I think I'm going to change it <laughs> on your way back to the dressing room. There's going to be somebody there meeting you to say, hey, you know, your idea wasn't as good as the one I had. And it's my business. So you might need to get a U-Haul and move <laughs> on. So you, you just learn to, you know, you're a soldier, you know. I used to describe it to young talent when I had FCW like this. If you worked at McDonald's and they told you to put two pickles on a hamburger and that's all, and you decided, I'm going to, I like pickles. I'm going to put five on this one. Somebody gets that hamburger, goes out, eats it, comes back to the manager and says, Hey, this hamburger is so good, man. When did you guys start putting five pickles on there? The manager is going to look around and said, who put five pickles on the hamburger? And you're going to raise your hand thinking you're a hero and he's going to go, you're fired. We don't put five pickles on a hamburger. So it's it's an understandable situation. You do what you're told to the best of your ability. And then you're judged by how you did it. So do it, do it right. I'm, as I say that, I'm, I'm just joking sort of thing, because it was actually one of like the big, uh, one of the more memorable stories from Florida was where I think at the time Don was working with a young Barry Windham and then he had the mm-hmm. magnificent M and the mask on and then you came in as well and you took the mask off and then when you took the mask off Don was bald and I asked it and I've asked him it's like why did you shave your head and he just went I don't know it just felt like the right thing to do at the time <laughs> Yeah, Don was a great guy. I mean, you know, he was his, he was in command of himself, though. Don was a he was a soloist. He he kind of did did and traveled where he wanted to go and did what he wanted to do. But he was a soldier just like me. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of Don Morocco stories, of course, out there. First of all, we have so much in common. Him and I are born on the same day. We're both September 10th babies, so you know. We have some things in common. He's, he, I think he's two years older than me, but it's not a big, big gap in there. But I mean, you know, he loves the water. I love the water. I mean, you know, I need, I can't be any farther than 10 miles from the Gulf of Mexico or I'm, I'm upset. And so, you know, he just was like, he came to Florida cause he could surf on the East coast and make the towns and he was in hog heaven. 
But, you know, so far as the mask, I'm sorry I let you down. If I could, <laughs> if I could reel back time, James, and tell you what I'd do, I'd just say, you know what? Leave the mask on, Don. Let somebody else pull <laughs> hey, it off. Hey, it was six years before I was born, so, you know, you didn't let me down, don't worry. Uh, do you know what? Okay. With, <laughs> with Don, um, there's a story. I've asked Jerry Briscoe the same story as well. And Don and Jerry have slightly differing versions of it. It was the day that Don, uh, so I think it was Dusty, was doing some sort of rock and roll uh, gig in like an auditorium somewhere. He decided that he like sang with Chuck Berry or something, and then or Willie Nelson or whoever, and then he decided he was going to be a rock and roll star himself, and he booked this auditorium. And Don sort of managed to somehow wander up on stage with him at any point were you there for that day no i wasn't but i've heard different versions but you know what here's the problem you know there's so much time from when you're talking about till the probably the story's told i've listened to guys on podcasts tell stories about me and not not necessarily trying to discredit me or harm me or whatever but they told a story that i'd never heard or they told a story that was nowhere near what actually happened. And I would have to call somebody else and say, hey, listen, you know, is it my memory or is it their memory? You were there. Now, did that happen? No, nah, no, nah, they're just embellishing the story. So that's what happens sometimes. And then I know you've heard this, that if you start a story in a group, of a circle of people and you say, okay, this, 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 and this. And by the time it gets back around, the whole story's changed because just passing it from one person to another, it changes. So I usually don't dispute people, but I know that there are discrepancies in stories sometimes. I mean, you know, I thought you were going to have Dutch on. I was going to ask Dutch a couple of questions because I've heard him in a podcast and he was always pretty, pretty much right on the money when he talked about me. But at the same time, I heard somebody else tell one of the stories he told, and it was totally different. And I don't know if it was out of resentment or jealousy. You never know in this industry. Sometimes guys are just jealous of where your position went and where theirs didn't. And sometimes they just, you know, just don't like you. <laughs> so they change the story and figure you're never going to hear it. So anyway... Hey, well, I'll tell you what, I mean, we can always do a part two at some point with Dutch as well, because I mentioned to Dutch who was speaking to you, and he was like, oh, well, we should get him on the show. Hey, so that's something that could be booked, but for now, sure. let's go to the beginning of uh, your career again. You're trained by Hero Matsuda, and uh, another story that I hear quite a lot is, uh, there was also like Florida's version of uh, Calgary's Dungeon, in the sense that it was just like a snake pit of some of the toughest guys in the world. I mean, I've written some names down. Hiro Matsuda, Bob Roop, J.R. Foley, Jack Briscoe. Bob Backlund. Uh, how was your training, essentially, and how did you get out of sort of the whole... There's the old story of Hulk Hogan getting his leg broken in the first five seconds kind of thing. How did you get out of uh, sort of getting your leg broken? How did you sort of get into being trained by Hero and all these other tough guys and getting their respect as well? Well, here's the thing. In Florida, Eddie Graham was the promoter and the owner. And Eddie Graham was a strict kayfabe man so far as wrestling. We protected our industry. And we were similar to, and when I make a comparison, a lot of people can understand, we were like magicians. People would watch and say, well, that didn't look real. And then they would see something, well, that looked real. Well, that, that. And then they sat on a fence of whether what was real or what wasn't. But they were never enlightened so it was always a mystery, and it held that kind of mass mystique for them to come see. So in Florida, I was um, I was a young kid that my dad was shot down in Vietnam when I was 13 years old. He was a prisoner of war from the time I was 13 to 21. So I was a kind of a, a young guy that wasn't fatherless, but he just wasn't there to apply discipline. And I grew up in an area that wasn't the greatest in Tampa. It was called Port Tampa, South Tampa, and that's where Hulkster grew up. Mike Graham grew up. Um, Dennis McCord, who later became Austin Idol, grew up. Dick Slater. We all grew up as little kids together. So we all came out of that same era. 
but but Eddie liked me because and I think it was more sympathy that my dad was, you know, sacrificing his freedom for our country in a war. And so he offered me opportunities to go fishing and hunting and everything. And when Mike and I were growing up, he didn't raise me, but he kind of mentored me too, to the point where, you know, he never enticed me with wrestling. But he gave me opportunities to pick guys up when I first started driving at the airport, driving them around, bringing them to the matches. So I knew a lot of the talent. I knew big stars and drove them around. And I, I really wasn't interested in being in the wrestling business because they always looked beat up. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you saw them up close and personal after the matches, you're going, oh, my God, I don't know. You, you don't look too good. And then and, and, so, you, and you said, sorry to interrupt, and you said in your book as well that some of the old timers, they couldn't like stretch their arms out properly because of all the elbows they were dropping. Oh, there were so many different things in there that kept me from being interested, like body problems. I mean, aches and pains, limited motion and, and, and old injuries and, and medicine wasn't that great in the early 70s. And so things hadn't developed like your ACL tear. I mean, you'd had to retire and get a cane. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays you can fix it. Well, back then, I mean, you know, I noticed all these things. And so, I mean, I was only 165 pounds when I graduated from high school. So I wasn't like a huge guy. I'm six foot tall. So I'm not like a monster standing there. And all the guys in the wrestling business were big men at that time. Now they were big barrel chested, but big guts. I mean, you know, they were just, um, husky men. And so I, I wasn't really enticed by it. But then I went to college because that was what my mom wanted me to do. She wanted me to graduate from college. Nobody in our family had ever graduated from college. So I went to college, but I, I had no idea what I wanted to be. Everybody kept saying, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I go, I don't know what makes the most money. And so it was nothing that ever came up about pro wrestling. Then I went away to college and I got on um, steroids in college and went from 165 to 240, came home and Eddie looked at me and goes, oh my God, what what have you been doing? You know, And I said, I've been powerlifting. And he said, have you thought about wrestling? And I said, not really. You know, And I kind of explained to him, said, I admire you guys, but I mean, you know, I, I kind of like being cute. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to end up looking like Abdullah the Butcher or King Curtis. Anyway, so when, it, when he started me out, I, I had lost all my drive to, for education. I just couldn't focus. And so I just said, well, let me give it a try. And when I first started, and of course, I went to the Sportatorium is where they film TV and it's, it's a hundred degrees in the shade there. And then, there's no air conditioning. There's no ventilation. There's a ring light in there. And then just the tension and the nervousness, you're, you're instantly sweating when you walk out there. And then you're thinking in the back of your mind, well, they're going to show me these moves and nothing's going to hurt. And I'm going to land on a bed of feathers and all this. And all of a sudden I get this wake up call and now I'm doing free squats to a deck of cards and I'm doing neck bridges and I'm doing sit-ups and I'm doing all these things push-ups and now i'm wrestling hero matsuda my sister could beat me by the time i'm ready to start and he's jamming my face in the mat and hooking me and back then there was no tap out it was scream i quit <laughs> and so i quit a lot of times and i'd come home to my mom and my mom would look at me and she'd go man she goes i thought wrestling was fake and i go so did i <laughs> <laughs> but I had this doubt, and now I'm convinced whatever everybody else is thinking isn't right. But the initial idea and the psychology of Eddie Graham was to build a respect for the industry and to protect it. And that's what we were taught in Florida. We were taught that if anybody challenged you and said, wrestling's fake, you said, okay, come on outside. Let's see who comes back in. And then, you know, you just had to, you had to face every challenge. You had to, no matter whether it was in a bar or on the street or in a mall or whatever, you had to make sure you established you weren't going to take people insulting you about that business. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. I started that six months of that. I wanted to quit. I, I thought about quitting. The only thing I could think of is I better move out of the state if I quit because I'll be too embarrassed to face Eddie. 
but then I finally stuck it out. And when I, when I made it to the point where they said he'll protect the business, that's when they changed and taught me to work. Now, of um, all the names I read out before, is like Hero, Jack, Bob Roop, J.R. Foley, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, you'd all get challenges here and there from fans. Even you did, and you, you know people would challenge the veracity of the sleeper hold, and you had to know how to put it on properly. But of the names I mentioned, or maybe other ones, who took sort of like the most pleasure in taking on the fans, taking on like these aspiring like bodybuilders or football players or something, and just sort of showing them what's what? Who really loved to sort of stamp their authority on people? Eddie Graham. <laughs> Eddie Graham. He loved it. I mean, you know, I witnessed some of the times when guys came to try out, and this was prior to actually being brought into the dressing room, into the inner circle. And I sat in that sportatorium and watched Bob Brew put guy in holes and, you know, almost break his arm or break his leg or whatever till the guy would crawl out screaming and take off running. And I witnessed that he followed him all the way to the door. And in his dress clothes, he would just beat him relentlessly. I mean, almost to the point where I'd get a stomach ache because of the violence. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but that's the only way I could describe it. But I mean, you know, I had to turn away a few times, you know, at, what, at, at how violent he got. And he enjoyed it. I mean, you know, that was his thing. I mean, a lot of the guys did what they were told, like Hero. I don't think Hero was really, you know, sadistic, but I often wondered if he took out on me sometimes that, you know, we won the war <laughs> <laughs> because of my dad being a military guy. I'm thinking, wow, Hero's beating me to death because something happened in a war you know, <laughs> back in the 40s. But Hero just... He, everybody had a different outlook on wrestling and it was a different initiation into the business in those days. And some places were strict and some places weren't. Calgary was the same as Florida. I mean, you know, there was, there was places, Vern Gagne and the AWA, he was pretty strict with his talent breaking them in, but I don't know how far they took them because it, I wasn't in there, you know, in, inductions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've skipped some questions. I'm going to go a bit forward. If you've got time later, I'll re-ask them at the end. But there's something that I... It's, it's almost like a bit of like wrestling trivia. So I think we're talking like 77 around there. Bob Backlund's in Florida. And Vince McMahon Sr. has his eye on Bob to become the next WWF champion. Now, there are two rumours floating around. And I think in the book you uh, sort of allude to them or just say them outright. Is that one... Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. and Eddie Graham had a $50 bet that Vince could get Bob over. And two, you, if Eddie had pushed hard, maybe, you could have been the person to be the WWF champion instead of Bob. Well, here's the thing about that story. I mean, Kevin Sullivan talks about it quite a bit on podcasts because he was close in that time with Mike and Eddie. And, you know, he has a different slant. He was the one that brought up the $50 bet. But back then, when it was all happening, uh, Bobby and I were actually partners here in Florida. And Bobby was, they were utilizing me to help develop Bobby because he had a little bit of a mechanical, um, unorthodox style to him. He was a um, great amateur and everything, but he was stiff. He wasn't loose, and he it wasn't fluid motion. And the one of the ways you learn in the industry is they put you with somebody that's been doing it longer with you, than you, and they get to see you up close and witness things, and it helps helps educate them. I learned from a lot of tag team partners over the years, but Bobby was um, had a credentials like Jack Briscoe, amateur background. He was a great athlete. I mean, he was a really good guy to be a partner with. But what I had heard, and all of it's hearsay because, first of all, Eddie's gone. Dusty's gone. Vince Sr.'s gone. So there's no way to actually give it any kind of um, credential other than, okay, this story was one way, this story is the other way. I was told by Eddie at the beginning 
that Vince was interested in me being the champion because of my dad's background as military and an all-American boy kind of flag-waving son of a war hero. And it fit perfect into his territory because a lot of nationalities and they could create angles and they could create feuds between guys because of their backgrounds and where they're from. Well, I, he also made me the um, world junior heavyweight champion and had me take the belt to Japan for New Japan Pro Wrestling and drop it to Fujinami to create a um, uh, ambassadorship between New Japan Pro Wrestling and the WWWF, which Vince Senior owned. So I was kind of like that metal piece that went over there and did the thing. And anyway, so I was told that when I came back, they were going to prepare me to go to New York. And I had already been up to New York a few times and worked the gardens. They had flown me and Dusty up there to work the gardens a few times. But one of the things was, is everybody's always come to me with this story and said, oh, man, and just think if you'd have been the WWWF world champion, what your career would have done. And I go, you know what? That didn't that didn't interest me at all. I wasn't interested in going to New York. I didn't want to go up there. And the reason I didn't wasn't because of the opportunity. It was because I had a fear of the cities. I mean, you know, when you travel the road in a car and you have to stop and ask directions, if you're not familiar with an area, and I would have had no clue how to get around New York City to get to Madison Square Gardens or Boston to get to the Boston Gardens or Philly. I mean, I had this fear of, you know, the unknown of going up there. So I was in a comfort zone of Florida, Georgia, you know, North Carolina and everything like that. But I mean, you know, it wasn't somebody waving a bone under my nose. And actually, then when I came back, Dusty and Eddie had me in the office and they told me, said, well, Vince has decided to go with Bobby and, you know, they're going to bring him up there and make him the champ and all that. And I'm going, great, a great opportunity for Bobby because Bobby wasn't from Florida. He was from Minneapolis. So he was used to being in the snow. <laughs> and so... When he, when he went, I was all behind it. But later on, then I kept hearing the stories change. And then when it got to be a $50 bet, I mean, you know, I could see all of those stories being true, but I really can't verify which is the true story. Was it that, that Vince wanted me and then Eddie decided to keep me? The first story I heard, Eddie wanted to keep me from going because he didn't have anybody here to replace me in Florida. He didn't want to lose a main talent to Vince and then have a void here of filling in my spot. And so Eddie enticed me by staying, by saying, okay, well, I'm going to hang everything on you. He made me the Florida heavyweight champion. He made a Florida tag team. He made me the brass knucks champ. He made me the TV champ. I had more belts and I had equipment. <laughs> and I mean, he just wrapped stuff around me to almost soothe me from losing that opportunity, which, I didn't want to go to begin with. I mean, you know, and then later on, of course, Don Morocco and some of my friends, Kevin Sullivan. Hey, why didn't you come to New York, man? They had you booked around as Andre the Giant's partner everywhere to get you over. And I said, well, I was told I wasn't supposed to go. So <laughs> it's hard to say what's right and what's wrong, James. But, you know, when you know that you don't really know the truth. It's better to just admit, I, I really don't know which way was the real true story, but I've heard it a couple of different ways. So, Yeah. This, as you've said to me before, New York was cold, so that's a strike against. It's a very busy strike against. Uh, let's say we take those two things out. Would you have been, because keep in mind, you would have been, what, about 26, 27, maybe somewhere around that, you know, maybe mid-late 20s. Would you have been, right. uh, take those two equations out, you know, the cold, the weather and, and the confusing cities and everything. Would you have been at that point mentally well equipped to have an entire territory of that size on your shoulders, do you think? Well, after going there a couple of times, like I said earlier, and appearing in the gardens, it would have taken some changes and dramatic changes. Because first of all, the ring which is so vitally important to your performance. All rings at that time were 18 by 18, and they were steel cable with a garden hose around them for the ropes. In the WWWF, it was 20 by 20 ring, 
it had real ropes that don't recoil you as fast as the, the cable ropes. And just the comfort zone of being in the ring and utilizing the ropes and things that I had done more as a younger guy, hitting the ropes of speed and utilizing different maneuvers and stuff with the ring, that I was going to have a, a learning curve. And then the other thing was is the wrestling style. The wrestling style of every place that I had worked had all been similar because it was NWA mostly, except for in Japan and Europe and places you'd have to go and learn their style and, and try to try to change yours, but not change your actual personality and, and adapt. Well, in New York, every time I wrestled there, and it was twice, once was Larry Sharp and the other was Johnny Rods, both of them were to home match were telling me, slow down, slow down. You don't need to do that. Slow down, slow down stop this ain't real here i mean you know because i'd light you up <laughs> and and i was into intense working wrestling and making believability out of stuff and even if i i mean you know to me in my in my work there was two moves that were always real and that was if i slapped you in the face or i chopped you so if i slapped you i slapped you seriously and you better have your mouth locked so I don't snap your jaw. But it's, it's a move that doesn't hurt. And in front of an audience, it's a stinging, yeah, and you feel it. But it makes a lot of noise and makes people go, ooh. And the same with the chop. Guys would chop. And if they really chopped you, you could hear it throughout the whole arena. But if they missed you, you still had to react to it, even though you know that it was horrible. So when I went there working with guys that didn't want to do anything, they were slow, they were lazy, they didn't move around much. I was going like, man, my style just might not fit in here, so I might have to really change. And I didn't learn that later on until I went to Tennessee, and I realized I had to change somewhere, and there's where I changed. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Tennessee, uh, we also lost Jerry Jarrett about six weeks ago uh, as we record this. Um, apart from maybe, you know, one of the lesser payoff men out there, uh, what are your memories of Jerry as far as uh, bringing you into the Territory and maybe giving you the most memorable character of your career as well? Well, to me, Jerry Jarrett was a promoter and I was a talent. And I had learned by the time I went there that you are working for somebody and be, be careful, because there's a song that goes, smiling faces hide no traces of the evil that lurks within. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? <laughs> and I always wanted to work the workers. When I, once I got to a certain level, and that's by the time Jerry Jarrett found me and Kevin Sullivan in Atlanta at the Omni, working for Jim Barnett, he wanted myself and Kevin to come to his territory and give it some reality. He wanted us to come bring more of the style that we had to his territory to, to give it a shot in the arm. Well, Jerry Jarrett, to me, was a genius so far as creativity, but I didn't have a deep set respect for him so far as talent because of his appearance. <laughs> <laughs> He looked pretty weak and pretty lame. And when I saw him in his tights when he was a big star and everything, I, I would say to him, did you ever go to a gym? I mean, you know, you got the body of a small girl. I mean, you know, <laughs> and I had been around guys that were athletes and stuff. And so there was a, not a lack of respect, but it was just kind of like not that Eddie Graham – you respected him the whole the whole package, but um, Jarrett, I respected his mind. But you know, when somebody tells you how to do something, you're looking at them, you're looking at where they're from, you're looking at all the the variables, and you're going, "Hey, that sounds good to you, but that don't sound good to me." So I just learned to adapt, and he's easy to talk to, and he and he and he gave me a lot of respect, and in my respect. For the, they gave me came from being one of Eddie Graham's guys, 
because he knew how smart Eddie was and he knew that Eddie was a finished guy and he knew Eddie was developed a talent guy. Eddie was a, he was meticulous about the things you did in the ring. And if he told you something and walked out there and watched it and you didn't do it, he knew it immediately. So, you know, you had to, you had to be on your toes when you worked for him. And so working for Jarrett was a step down from that, but it gave me an opportunity that when he said, I'm going to hand you the ball, I'm going to hand you the ball and you run with it. And what you do, I'll back, but you're going to be in charge of certain parts of what you do where that, that didn't usually happen. Most of the time you just kind of like went with it, but there he gave us opportunities and Stan Lane was a great guy. He was a very creative guy. He was a close friend, easy to deal with. I mean, you know, never had an argument, never had a, any discrepancies of anything between us. We were always, always got along. Not one harsh word between us, but at the same time, he would give me some kind of authority between us in the tag matches and stuff and say, okay, well, ask Steve. And then when I would double cross the road warriors or somebody, he just went along with it, you know, <laughs> and said, I'd tell him, okay, Stan, um, pack your bag and put it by the door. Cause we're not coming back to the dressing room. <laughs> You're going out through the back door. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, before we talk about the fabulous ones very uh, briefly, I have to ask, and I read this in the book, Jerry Lawler once came to you and asked you to essentially be a hitman. Not killing somebody else, but uh, hurting them. You have to tell us that yes. story. Well, I think Jimmy Hart embellished the story more because it was just like a passing time to me that, Basically, somebody had kind of dropped the hint or more kind of like wanted me to put some pressure on somebody in a match. And here's the thing, James. First of all, I'm not a shooter. I mean, you know, there are guys that do that and there are guys that get, can get away with that and can back it up. I wasn't a shooter. I, I know how to protect the business. I knew how to handle an audience and somebody jumping in the ring. I knew how to do all of those things. But as for just going out there and challenging people or whatever, and when you hand yourself to somebody in a match, they're basically trusting you and your reputation is, is okay, I can be trusted. Now, once you step out of that and you do something to hurt somebody, then basically you have a black mark that never leaves. It's like having straight A's in school and one F. And when that F comes up, it comes up strong. And when it came up, it was a situation where Jerry Lawler, and I don't remember exactly the story so far as relationship with a girl or a fan or whatever, but he was mad at Chick Donovan, who was an innocent guy and never, you know, like really deserved to have any injury or hurt. And he wanted me to hurt him. And like I said earlier, the most misused phrase in wrestling is I'm sorry. And then I would have, if, I'd have, if I'd have broke his leg by putting on a figure four or something and then just went the extra mile and snapped it and said, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'd have been off the hook. But I knew the story had come out later. Well, I was told to break your leg when I went in there. And that's what I had in my mind. But Jimmy Hart was the one that gives me the credit for because he knew the whole story. And he said, I'll never forget that when Steve Kern was asked to do something, he just looked at him and said, I ain't doing that. But it's not for me to take up for somebody else. It's for them to handle their own situations. If I have a problem, I need to handle it myself. I don't need to ask somebody else to do something for me. Now, I'm blessed because I was smart enough in the wrestling business to be best friends with the toughest guys in the wrestling <laughs> business. So it's not about Steve Kern. It's about Steve Kern's friends. So if you're going to hurt Steve Kern, you better be careful because it's somebody that's really tough is going to get you when you least expect it. So that the story, it's not as exciting probably as you thought it would be. But the real fact was, is when I was asked, I just refused to do it. And of course, you know, we had our differences, him and I, but one of the things I was told when they, actual Jerry Jarrett came and asked me to come to his territories. He said, you know, I want you to come work Tennessee. And I said, well, I've always heard 
don't go to Tennessee. Don't go to Tennessee because you'll never get over Lawler or Dundee. They switched the book. One will be the booker for six months and the other be the booker. They're going to control the main events and they're going to control all the money. And I said, well, you know, that's kind of a challenge. <laughs> don't go because you don't want to worry about where you're going or go and dirty up the water. And because now you're not that minnow in a sea of sharks. Now you're a hammerhead and here you come. And so that's the way I challenged. And I was, like you said, I was right at 30 years old then. And I was mature for my industry because I'd already been wrestling 10 years. And I'd had great, great people put a lot of time and investment in me and, and Harley Race and Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk and Bill Watts and all these guys that I came with a lot of credentials and, and no fear. So... <laughs> Anyway, I have to ask this as well. Uh, with the fabulous ones, we can't talk to Steve Kern without bringing up the fabulous ones, and we can't mention the fabulous ones without uh, discussing some of the glamour shots, the photographs that you uh, took and sold. And do you hold the record, you and Stan, of making the most money at the gimmick table, do you think, in Memphis? We blew them away. <laughs> <laughs> James, I mean, you know, you're an intelligent guy. And here's the thing. If you were to think about people buying your merchandise and you're a baby face and you're going to sell pictures, who do you think would be the most interested in buying pictures of men? And Stan and I thought, well, you know, of course, girls, women. I mean, you know, guys buy your picture, but not as much as women would. So when are you gonna when are you gonna focus your picture around? Are you gonna focus your pictures around selling them to guys and being a macho look and trying to you know come across as a badass or whatever? Or are you gonna sell pictures that you go, hey, this is kind of like calendar stuff. This is kind of like you know, hey, I, I don't know about later on in life if I'm gonna like these pictures floating <laughs> around, but for the time being. It became very competitive. And you have to remember who we were competing with. And when once we started and we clicked, then all of a sudden a whole new set of tag teams started being created, including the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Rockers. I mean, you know, it just the fantastics. It just started snowballing. So now we're in competition at those picture tables too. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I kind of like don't really value that too much, but the, the story and the honest psychology was, is who can we sell the pictures to and how can we make the most money? And that's what we designed it. And Jimmy Cornette, that was his first job. He was our photographer. So he would come up with ideas. And sometimes I'd look at Stan and go, you know, man, some of these pictures, you know, it's like borderline, but <laughs> It's just like in my years of school, if I'd have had a mullet and got my high school graduation picture made with a mullet, 30 years later, young people are going to come to me and say, oh, wow, look at you had hair and you had a mullet and you're this and that. So you just have to accept your youth and you have to accept <laughs> the ignorance sometimes. And I mean, you know, when I had FCW, a lot of talent would come up and say, hey, coach, What's this picture of you? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't sign them for them. See you later. I've got to say, no, you know, no, no, I, I, I wanna, I'm going to stick up for you. Uh, doubly so, because one, you said you blew everyone else away with the uh, uh, money that you made. And two, Jerry Lawler started copying you. Then Bill Dundee started copying you. And then Dutch even told me that he was talked into one of these uh, more racy glamour shots to aim at the women, you know, sort of like the topless thing. The thing is with Dutch, you couldn't tell if he was topless or not because he was so hairy. He looks like he's wearing a sweater either way. That's true. <laughs> but, 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 but you saw what other guys were doing. You saw who was making the money. You saw what, what people were interested in buying. And whether you liked it or not, um, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And so you imitate what's successful. Give me, and uh, sorry, uh, 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 give me give me a uh, a week 
takings from the photos just like an average week let's say you've got like you know third set of photos or whatever one week at the gimmick tables how much would you and stan bring in from them from just the photos well, it varied it varied and it's and it's you know to embellish it or to make it you know a constant thing it kind of depended on a couple of variables and that's what angle were we in what part of the show we had monopolized did we have a new video out to music? Because that's one of the things that made us more creative than beating enhancement guys. And then the picture actually selling. Now, we tried a lot of different things and merchandise. We tried T-shirts. We tried hats. We tried several different things. And it was just, you know, it was a lot of work to carry that stuff. And then you didn't have the right size. You didn't have the right color. I mean, there were so many reasons people didn't do it. So we'd limit ourselves to pictures. And then we came up with a concept of bandanas. It's just a square piece of material that you could stack a thousand and carry in your hand into the building. And you could sell them for $2 a piece. And it cost you about two cents to make them. So we had runs where we would make quite a bit of money. And then we had runs that were, you know, I give you an example. A lot of the territories were seasonal to the point where there was downslides. Like when school would start, some of your weekly towns, the attendance would go down because people had to put kids in school, get them back in regimented time things. And then Christmas when people are saving money and they're not spending money on entertainment. So you had to pick and choose. But in the red hot times in the summer when kids are out of school and there's nothing to do and people go to wrestling and all that and the arenas were full. And I mean, you know, we do sometimes up to four or five thousand dollars a piece a week on on merchandise. And that was far more than we were making. I mean, you know, Jerry Jarrett, I'd say, I mean, there's pictures in, in the book and then in history, too, of of us having, you know, um, cars like we bought Corvettes, '65 and a '67 classic Corvettes, and we bought that with picture money. I bought an old yellow truck that looked like ZZ Top truck. Bought it from picture money. It was just extra money. What we call it now, and and what younger people, well, I don't know if the young guys do, but probably I got outdated myself. But I call it mailbox money, and mailbox money is coming for something you don't really do physically. Mm -hmm. It's given you an opportunity to make money like autograph sessions, I mean, you know, signings, um, you know, different things, merchandise, action figures came into play in the AWA. We were part of the first action figures ever, Stan and I, with Remco Toys. And so, you know, you get these opportunities and, and that was one of the territories where you had an opportunity and you either did it or you didn't. Some guys didn't want to waste time with it. They didn't do so well. Some guys would that would be their main thing and they'd hustle. But, you know, you had to go out there and, you know, be personable. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's part of it. You can't go out there with an attitude and sell things because people recognize that it doesn't take long to spread like fire word of mouth through fans. But if you're a good person and, you know, generally appreciated fans. And one thing that I learned from Florida was we learned to appreciate the fans and I went to a lot of territories where guys had come in complaining about the fans. Ah, oh, I didn't. They didn't react. Ah, oh, they didn't. And I just look at them and says, maybe it was you. <laughs> they didn't want to hear that. But at the same time, as if there's no fans, there's no money. If there's no money, you don't have a job. I mean, you know. So let's get real. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be thanking them for coming. You should walk all the way to the ring and look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Like Elvis Presley. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for buying that ticket every week. You're in the same seat. Thank you, brother. I mean, you know, so where's the real appreciation? The appreciation is turning back around and taking an opportunity and thanking them for doing things. But sometimes they're not that way. Hey, well, uh, I believe the, uh, a lot of wrestlers these days are more concerned with having a quote unquote four star match than, uh, selling tickets, but that's by the by. We we could get into that, I'm sure, as well. But I want to play a little game with you now. It's called Name Association. I am going to give you a sentence, a description, and I would like you to give me the first name from any territory, from any promotion that you think best suits that description. And the uh -oh. first, and the first one is there's quite a few of these. I'll pick the best ones. The funniest person in the locker room. 
The Nasty Boys. <laughs> Any reason? Yeah, because they were insane. <laughs> they were all they they were always doing things, whether it was funny or just stupid. It kept you in a good mood. A lot of guys didn't like them. I mean, they had a lot of heat. But myself and my close friends like Kurt Henning, we loved them. And the reason we did is because they would say outlandish things to talent that didn't want to have those things said to them. But they couldn't do nothing to them because they were pretty tough at the same time. So they would be kidding around but they would say and do things to me that was hilarious. I didn't overreact by going, laying down on the floor, kicking my feet, laughing. But by the time I got into the car with them and drive 200 miles home, I'd put them over like that was great. I mean, I remember one time and I, I don't mean to go off, but you said I could, but we were coming back from Memphis, Tennessee. And it was myself and Kurt Henning had flown in from AWA and we we're going to Nashville. And we, I wasn't living in that territory at the time. And so Kurt and I were dependent on staying with the nasty boys in Nashville in their apartment. And <laughs> we were riding in the car and we gave a, a Japanese reporter named Jimmy Suzuki a ride with us and he had to sit in the middle between the nasty boys in the back seat. And on the way there, on the way home, after some guys had had a few beers and things started loosening up, somebody in the front seat realized it was December 7th and December 7th is Pearl Harbor day. Oh. And I want to say that I don't want to, admit to who started this but all of a sudden i'm thinking december 7th pearl harbor day hey wait a minute and now we got a guy that doesn't speak that good of english sitting right in the middle between the two nasty boys in the back seat and that just opened up a whole can of worms because when i turned around and said you know my old man was in that war but he fought the germans he said but if he'd have fought you guys you know He'd have been right in there against you, too. So today, you guys dropped the bombs. You dropped all that on Pearl Harbor. You know, we should we should pull over and do something to you. And then the nasty boys started on him. And all they did was, um, from both sides, like stereo in the guy's ear, was, <laughs> and they were imitating Japanese people speaking. But the humor in it, went on for 200 miles and Jimmy Suzuki was losing it. And by the time we got back um, to the apartment and they actually shared an apartment with Marty Gennetti and Shawn Michaels at the time. So by the time we got back, all four of them are on poor Jimmy Suzuki because it had started and it just kept snowballing. And when we got there, Jimmy Suzuki freaked out and took off. And when he took off, he was in the parking lot. So Kurt got in the rental car. And decided he's going to chase him through the apartment complex. And they chased him. And then he, we finally talked him into coming back. And we said, we'd, we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't do anything. And somehow or another, when he fell asleep, somebody shaved his eyebrows off. Oh, classic. Both of them. The classic. And when he, when he woke up, he freaked out. And, of course, that night he told Jerry Jarrett's mom, who ran Louisville, oh, Miss Jarrett, you know. Of course, so my name always gets at the beginning of these things. It was a Steve Kern and the nasty boy shaved my eyebrows off. And I didn't shave anybody's eyebrows off, and that's legitimate. But I know that Sean and Marty put Band-Aids over their eyebrows just to keep from having their eyebrows <laughs> And I have a feeling it was one of them. But anyway, Jimmy Suzuki and that, that whole situation was, was pretty funny. But the Nasty Boys were always the funniest guys in the dressing room. I mean, there's other guys. But the dressing room is not usually about humor. It's in the car when all the tension's off going home. It's where it gets to be funny. You're telling funny stories or you're telling misery stories or you're telling war stories. And so... You know, Dutch was a funny guy. I know he's not here right now, but Dutch 
would crack me and Stan up. He'd ride with me and Stan and CB radios were real popular at the time. They're traveling and we'd get bored and get on a CB radio because it's like the Internet. I give you an example. It's like Facebook or mm -hmm. social media. People can give you crap on it because you ain't facing them. You can't have a confrontation with on CB radio. You can talk on that radio, but the truck drivers don't know who's talking and where they're at. And we would pick on truck drivers and we, we would create scenes, but Dutch had a really good, um, he'd do a storyline where he would pretend to be somebody that he wasn't and, you know, get the truckers all riled up by saying things that he knew would make them mad. And we'd be laughing because if they'd be on there, all of them would be so angry and want to kill Dutch. But Dutch would just, once he'd get to a point where they're so angry, they'd stop talking, then he'd start hitting them again. And, you know, you're just bored. You're bored <laughs> traveling all the time. So you're trying to create funny situations. But The uh, the next one is, uh, I have to clarify this now, because some people think I mean fighting when I mean drinking. The last man standing at the bar. Andre the Giant. Uh, this is perfect time for an Andre story. First time you met Andre. Andre story. I mean, Andre the Giant. There's nobody could out drink Andre. I mean, you know, guys could drink. A lot of guys are heavy drinkers. But Andre, I mean, you know, I was blessed to be close to Andre, and it's because I was a mark for him. I mean, when I first met Andre, I was just a kid in the dressing room, and I warmed up to him because it, he was the coolest guy in the dressing room. He was the coolest looking. He was, he was a freak. And at first, you know, it's like, in the dressing room, I wanted to try on his ring. I wanted to try on his boots. I want to try on your tights. I want to try and just put the stuff on it. Look like it's in my dad's clothes. And then, you know, it was, it was warming up, but he knew that I just liked him. I mean, you know, and he, we, him and I became really close, but Andre, when he'd travel with you, I mean, he would drink a bottle of that crown Royal on the way to the show, he had more of those little purple bags that that stuff came in and he could wrestle on, drink a whole bottle of crown Royal and wrestle. And then afterwards, when you stopped to get beer, he wanted to buy a case. And I'm going, brother, it's only 80 miles from Orlando from Tampa. He says, Oh, I need a case. I said, okay. <laughs> and he could pound them down, but the, a can of beer looked like a baby bottle in his hand. And, you know, he just, you're, you're talking about a legitimate, real deal giant. And he could just put any kind of anybody under a table. And I wasn't there, but I'm not exactly sure how many cans, but it seems like it was over a hundred of Coors. And I think it was Las Vegas that he drank that became a big legendary story. But I buy every bit, I buy every bit of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he, he could put, alcohol away did you always team with andre or did you i think you teamed with andre did you did you ever wrestle andre oh no no i never did i mean you know i'd have made him look like a million dollars but that would, would have been easy because he was a million dollars but i was always partners with them when they would bring him in and you know it's it was a great shot in the arm for me but it, it was a job my job was to sell get let the heels get the heat on me and then give Andre the big hot tag. And that was my job. And there was, I, you know, I took pride in it. I mean, I was fortunate enough to not let my ego get out of, out of proportion like a lot of guys do. You don't choose whether you're a champion. You don't choose whether you win or lose. But if you're a humble person and you, you do your job, then that's how you're accepted. And whenever I was told to let somebody beat me, I didn't go, ah. I don't want them to beat me. I'm better than them. I would do it with grace and with pride and say, you know what? What do you want to do? I'm going to make you look better than anybody's ever made you look. Because that's what you're doing. And when it's, you're given that opportunity and somebody's doing it for you, you want them to react the same way. And so the idea is, is when you have to do something, do it. And when I was Andre's partner, it was pretty much go out there and do a few moves. They call it shine now, but they didn't call it that. It was just more getting over. And the baby face did a few moves, and then boom, the heels actually healed. You know, looked looked at the referee and did something behind his back. 
I mean, you know, I know that's not a part of anything now, but at the same time, the referees were utilized. So, yeah, I was blessed. And Andre, he was, he was, a, he was a great man. Uh, the next one is I, I get the same few names every time for this. The smelliest wrestler. Yeah, that's easy. And I know whose name you get, Buddy Roberts of the Freebirds. <laughs> Okay, the Freebirds were a six were a three man tag team, and Buddy Roberts and Terry Gordy were the workers. Michael Hayes was the color, the interviewer, and pretty much the entertainer. And you know, Michael knows because I tell him to his face. But when I'd have to wrestle him with a tag team partner, we were always hoping we'd wrestle Buddy Roberts and Terry Gordy for the match, but we didn't like working with Terry Gordy because he stunk and he never washed his clothes and he took pride in smelling and it was horrible. And there was a several moves that you really avoided like cancer, like head scissor. When you try to head scissor, you definitely didn't want to be anywhere near his crotch or his tights. And then even him pulling you into a headlock because you're right there by his tights. But he was probably the smelliest guy I ever worked with. You were uh, you. You said Buddy Roberts at first, and you said Terry Gordy. Were you meaning Buddy Roberts for the story then? Buddy Roberts yeah. is the one that smelled. Terry yeah. Gordy didn't smell. Terry Gordy was the best worker on that team. Uh, now this is one that's going to be probably WWF centric when you were working as an agent. But who was most in trouble with the agents? Who was always most in trouble with the office? Rob Van Dam. <laughs> I didn't well, expect that one. It's it's you know it's it's not so much as trouble. It was just that if you had him, like if I was an agent, and we went through a production meeting, and I had Rob working against somebody, I knew I was going to have. Sorry, slight audio issue there. Okay, sorry about that. It was uh, my fault then. The the Zoom totally totally crashed. So sorry, Rob Van Dam. Was the uh, was the man who was most in trouble with the office? Well, he wasn't in trouble so much with the office as more the agents. He was a problem because he was hard to deal with sometimes. Not <clears throat> not necessarily match wise or anything. It's just be, being able to find him. And when you're under pressure of Monday Night Raw or a pay per view, a live show, you had to really make sure you, you were on top of your talent. And then you had to make sure they were standing there ready to go to the ring when their match got come up. So you had to be on top of it. He was one of the guys you had to really follow around and hold by the hand almost. <laughs> most most guys knew their role. Where did he go? Was he hiding around the arena or just leaving entirely? Or where was he hiding? Well, you have a lot of dead time. When you have to show up at, let's say, Raw or a pay-per-view, you show up, let's just say the talent has to be there at like 1 o'clock. Okay, 1 o'clock... To eight o'clock when the show starts, there's seven hours. Then your match may not come up for two hours into the show. So then you add two more, that's nine. Well, guys would just, it's not, they wouldn't do things deliberately. It's just that they would not be in positions where most guys were, either in catering or in the dressing room where you could find them. They might be out in the arena. They might, they might be in their car. Who knows? But at the same time, locating him was a, was a problem more than anything else. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a few more of these. And the most reckless wrestler you ever faced? Didn't face him. But the most reckless wrestler that I know of was Vader. And it was with enhancement guys, mm -hmm. TV guys. And he hurt a lot of guys. And so he had a reputation of hurting talent. And that's a taboo in my business. I was blessed that I didn't wrestle reckless guys. I mean, I had matches when I was younger against guys that were irritated with me because of lack of knowledge or skill in the ring and would manhandle me a little bit in the match and get upset if they I wasn't in the right spot at the right time. And you'd hear him cuss a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> and you know, it's your fault, but what are you going to do? And so, but so far as reckless and this hurting people, 
in a territorial day, my day that I started in, you didn't, there wasn't a lot of reckless guys. And the reason was, was nobody wanted to work with them. Mm -hmm. Guys didn't want to work with two, two types of guys, reckless and clumsy. And sometimes clumsy is as bad as reckless where they just trip and fall on you or where they're not in the right place. And whether your, their timing is off or different things like that, you know, guys that get older and slower didn't want to move around. They didn't want to get knocked down to have to get up to get knocked down again. I mean, you know, so there's different degrees of that that you can consider reckless, but at the same time, it's just, you know, the different degrees of where they're at in the company or where they're at in their, you know, experience in the wrestling business at the time. Mm. So I was blessed. I mean, you know, if, if I had somebody that I knew of that I could put my finger on that they're reckless, I wouldn't mind saying, you know, I hated to wrestle this guy <laughs> because I never knew if I was going to walk out alive. So, but I never had that problem. I mean, you know, I think they all knew that I was friends with the toughest guys in the wrestling <laughs> business. <laughs> hey, speaking of which, speaking of which, the friends with the toughest guys in the wrestling business, who was the most legit tough badass? The absolute king. Har Haku. Everyone says Haku. Have you actually have you actually seen Haku in action, or is this all secondhand stories? Mostly secondhand stories, but believable ones. And I'm, I mean, you know, I I can see it happening. I mean, you know, and one time was he was they were trying to arrest him somewhere, and I think it was in California, and he was getting tasered and just ripping the tasers out and throwing cops around, and you know, just just a man man handling people but um i ribbed him when he first came to, to the united states he came to florida and he was prince tonga and he was about 185 pounds and little did i know he would end up being the toughest guy in the wrestling business and he was a little kind of a target for me because he was so naive and I was notorious for catching animals on the way to the matches. And what I mean by that was anything that crossed the road in front of me on some of the long stretches and the Everglades and places, I got out and chased it because I'd like to catch it. And I'd catch snakes. I'd ca I caught an armadillo one time. And Paul Orndorff and I were riding to West Palm. And I told Paul Orndorff, I said, you see those armadillos on the side of the turnpike? I'll bet you a hundred bucks I can run one down. And Paul's looking at me and he's going, no way. And I got out and I put my towel that I was going to use that night up in front of me like I'm hiding behind it. And I got down on the interstate and I, I went all the way to the grass where it got high. And I cut them off from there to the turnpike by just being lower than them. And I got in front of them, and then I took off. And when they take off, they're not as fast as a rabbit, but they scoot along pretty good. And I was young enough that I could keep up with them, but the idea was is they could turn back and forth real quick on you. So I took my towel and just dove on this armadillo, and I hooked him, and I got him in my towel, and we put him in the trunk. And when we got to West Palm, I said, you know, I'm going to put him in somebody's wrestling bag. and course i said Ponga, because i got a feeling i'm going to get the best reaction out of him and that's the only reason it wasn't any reason personally it was just personal entertainment on myself and paul Orndorff's <laughs> side and i put it in his bag and when he went to open his bag the head popped up of a live armadillo which he had no idea what that was in his bag and he freaked totally out and the reaction was enough to keep humor and stories alive for 50 years about what happened. So look, Tonga, now there are legitimate tough guys too that I can give credibility to that some of them, I, I, I can give you an example that nobody would ever know, but Bobby Eaton was a legitimate tough guy, but he was so humble and so, you know, kind that he knew never think it. But I was in a situation in Memphis one time where we did an angle where I got my arm hooked in the top in the second rope where I did a thing over the top and hooked the ropes and it looked like I had my arm tied in there. 
And Bobby was trying to beat it with a chair because I needed to have an elbow operation and we needed a reason for me to be gone. And I saw a fan running from where I was hanging. I could see him over Bobby's shoulder headed for the down to the ring. And I said, Bobby, here comes the mark. And he turned around. And from where I was hanging, I watched Bobby time the guy perfect, whereas the guy jumped the rail. And Bobby didn't sucker him or catch him in a weak spot. He let the guy actually come all the way to him. And the guy threw a punch at Bobby. And Bobby stuck out his left hand. And he caught him by the throat. And when the guy threw the punch, Bobby pulled his head back and it went right by him. And then Bobby came up with his right hand and knocked him right out. And then I saw him start punching fans along the ringside area with no fear. Just, you know, anybody wants to come, come on. And then he handled them all. And I got a total respect for Bobby just in that instant and never saw it again. But I saw it one time and that's all it took for me to know. Bobby Eads a tough guy. You know, he's just a nice guy. So people don't think about him being a tough guy, but mm. I did. Yeah, the nicest guy as well. And uh, for people, I don't know how many people remember this. In 94, you briefly tagged with him in WCW as well. <laughs> Bad attitude. Bad attitude, yeah. Did it, Did you, were you just sort of put together or did one suggest the other or how did uh, you two well, get linked up? Actually, Ric Flair suggested it. And because Bobby had been Stan's partner, Midnight Express, and I had been Stan's partner, Fabulous Ones, and Bobby and I, you know, had a lot of similarities and stuff. And it was kind of a situation we were just kind of thrown together to create something. But at the time, Eric Bischoff was in charge. And I wasn't a real big supporter of Eric Bischoff's because it always felt like he was more of a fan in there in control and he acted like it with the big contracts and who he was sucking up to and who he wasn't and i never had a confrontation with him but i never was a big fan of his so far as being a smart intelligent guy that had the opportunity to run the business and knew what he was doing so he was lost for what to do with me when i first went there after being skinner and then a short thing was doink I went down there and he wanted me to be like a Jake the snake. He asked me to get some kind of wild animal to carry to the ring and come up with some character. So I came up with a fully camouflage thing, my face, the whole deal camouflage. And I had an 11 and a half foot albino Python and I'd carry it to the ring. And the only guy that would bring it back was Steven Regal because he loves reptiles. Mm -hmm. And so it only lasted a couple of times, and they didn't know what to do with that character. And so they said, well, we don't know whether to make a baby face or a heel out of it. You've been a heel, you've been a baby face. So <laughs> it was just a loss because they were being flooded by so much talent. It wasn't nothing personal. It just, <laughs> excuse me, they, were, they weren't sure what to do with me. And sometimes you get guys that have talent, but you're just not sure where to put them. I was one of those guys, and when they put us, me and Bobby together, they had already beat Bobby like a drum. You know, they had turned him into a job guy, and now they're trying to refresh him. And, you know, <clears throat> it was a compliment to me to have Bobby Eaton as a partner because he was one of, one of my closest friends. And I have a, like, you know, top guys in my mind. The number one guy in my mind is Kurt Henning, was the one of the greatest workers or the greatest worker all around everything, being able to talk, being able to work in the ring, balance, control of his body, second generation wrestler. He was a guy. And then Bobby Eaton was, but you know, he just didn't have great promos. He was, he was lacking in a few things, but so far as skill in the ring, he could do anything. And plus he could make anybody look good or make himself look good. So. Absolutely. Uh, I'll give you a couple more and then uh, I'll pause the recording anyway. Uh, best enhancement talent slash jobber, whichever way you want to put it. Barry Horowitz. You're not the first to say that either. Well, I have respect for Barry. I mean, you know, and the reason I do this because I have respect for anybody that comes into that dressing room or anybody that steps over that threshold wanting to get into business. You don't, you don't predetermine what you're going to do. You don't call your own shots you, unless you're like the booker or you're the family member like you're the son of the guy that owns the territory you're pretty much taking whatever you get 
And Barry Horowitz had a passion for the business, which to me is the main ingredient. If you have passion, you're going to succeed. But he had a passion for the business that no matter what he was handed, he was going to do it and do it to the best of his ability. And nobody really felt like they could make money with him to the point where they were going to make him some superstar. And he, they used him to get guys over and he, he could work. And he did a great job. There's a guy locally here in Tampa that never really got too many opportunities. And he would have he would have done well if somebody would have gave him an opportunity. His name was Bob Cook. Yeah. And Bob, Bob Cook, to me, is a great worker. Bob Cook, to me, is great talent. He just didn't get the opportunity. And that's kind of the luck of the business. I mean, you either get an opportunity and you, you make the most out of it, or you don't get an opportunity and you float around until you either quit or you just accept who you are and what you do. And Barry kind of accepted, hey, if I'm going to do jobs, I'm going to at least have a job. So <laughs> best uh, enhancement. Loudest spot caller. Ox Baker. <laughs> That's a good name. Ox Baker. I mean, he called the spot so loud, the referee and Roy would be going, K Fabe. K Fabe. Uh, and I'd say, I'd try to do like this Hey, Ox, not so loud. What? I mean, you know, I don't know if he was hard to hear. It. I mean, Stan Hansen was my first tag team partner, and Stan's deaf in one ear. And if you're not on the right side of Stan, he's going to say what a thousand times. So I don't know what the problem was, but Ox Baker, and, and especially in his matches, because it, Ox was a great attraction at one time, but in Florida, he was only a mid-card attraction. And I think it was because that he's a little lazier, or a little bit more New York style of just a big brawler. And <clears throat> so the matches were not really that loud a lot of times. So sometimes, you know, you had to beg the audience to pay attention. But <laughs> Ox would try to call a spot, not realizing nobody in the building saying anything except for him. And he would be the loudest. <laughs> Uh, I think I'll give you two more from this list. Uh, uh, and this is a WWF-centric one where you're an agent. The best and worst road agents for the WWF, WWE. The best and the worst road agents? Yeah. Well, to me, I can go with the worst first. And the reason was is because it was when I was a talent. And <clears throat> everything in wrestling... So as far as you want to hear from me is everything in wrestling to me is an opinion, everything from a fan's point, from talent's point, from anybody that doesn't even watch wrestling, they have an opinion about it and it's because of their experience and whatever. But when I got to WWF and did Skinner, I had road agents then, and that was really the first time I'd ever really dealt with road agents. And I had Rene Goulet, which is a, he was a great guy. I had Jack Lanza, which is a great guy. I had, um, um, who else? A couple other guys. But the worst to me was Chief J. Strongbow. And the reason was, is he had a real chip on his shoulder and an attitude. And <clears throat> he, he had this thing about putting himself on a pedestal that he was kind of like a great worker at one time and all these different things. And then plus an Indian, which he was an Italian, and I'd already seen him as Joe Scarpa in Florida. So I wasn't really impressed with the Indian thing and the the dancing and the chop and all of that. And then that silly ch tomahawk chop on top of your head that wouldn't have break an egg. And <clears throat> I just didn't have a whole lot of respect. And then he would tell me things like, when I come back from my match, Everything that I did, he had to report. And when I come back from a match, he'd look at me and it was almost like he was trying to pull something out of there, just searching or nitpicking is maybe more of the thing. And he put his arms behind his back and he'd rock back and forth and he'd look at me and say, well, Skinner, I think you got 37 seconds too much heat out there. And I'm looking at him going, 37 seconds? Why don't you just pull that one out of your butt? And I knew that he was reporting to the office and, you know, he was looking for things to have to say. And then all I could think about is him reporting on me 
places where Vince wasn't or, you know, Pat Patterson, Booker at the time wasn't and saying, well, Skinner got too much heat or Skinner did this or Skinner did that or whatever. And so I didn't really get along with him too well. Now, the, to me, one of the best agents was pretty much Fit Finley. And the reason Fit was a good agent is because Fit was a serious worker. And I mean, you know, I'd met Fit working for either Brian Dixon or Conway over there in Europe, and I'd worked against him, or maybe it was when I worked for Otto and I worked against Fit there. I'm not even positive where I first met Fit, but I worked against him. And he was so easy in the ring, but really believable. And he laid stuff in. I mean, you know, you felt him when you worked with him, which was what I like. But <clears throat> at the same time, he had a way of talking to people that he was working with and talent and getting his point across and still having the respect. And, you know, they liked him. And that's part of working with talent. Talent has to like you if they're working with you to give you any credibility because if they don't like you, they might go out of their way to not do things right. So it looks like you. Whenever I had a match as an agent working for Vince, if the match went out there and they did something wrong in the ring, do you think Vince yelled at them? Mm -mm. Vince would cuss me like a dog. I mean, he would talk to me like nobody had ever talked to me. And up and down. And I'm wanting to say, and I knew better not to, but I want to say, hey, I wasn't even out there. Because they're making mistakes and because they did something wrong, I'm not in control of that. And then finally, I just listened to everything he'd have to say, and I figured it out early as an agent, and I just said, you know what? It's all my fault. I'm going to do everything I can to never let that happen again. And he'd walk away. But other than that, He'd be on you. And so if you if the talent didn't like you, they knew they could get you in trouble. And it'd be a matter of a time and so many, you know, getting in troubles when you'd be a different agent someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the last one. And uh, this doesn't have to involve you, but the most memorable backstage fight. Hmm. Actually, Never saw one other than Jack Briscoe's. I've heard a lot of them. I heard the story about Orndorff and Vader from several different people that accounted for it. And because I was close friends with Orndorff, I knew it was right on the money. But I never saw Paul and Vader get into the fight. I never witnessed when Dickie Slater, who was the one I grew up with, beat up um, the warrior. But I knew that was possible, and he probably did it. And everything I heard about it sounded like what Dickie Slater would have done. Um, you know, there wasn't really that many fights. I mean, first of all, in the territory I grew up in, it was always separate dressing rooms. So if there was a fight, it would have to be between the baby faces or between the heels. And so, you know, never heard of one like, in the other guy's dressing room, oh, man, you missed it. They got in a big fight. You go looking to see what they look like. You know, well, who won? Well, let's go look at them, and I'll be able to tell you who won that fight. <laughs> but, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I got into a fight with Coco Beware, and Dutch tells the story. Um, other people tell the story. But the simple thing was is I never embellished the story. It was a situation where, Things just, you know, didn't work out. And I was taught to protect my gimmick and somebody was imitating the gimmick a little too strong, called him out. I sucker punched him. It was my fault, but I started it. And then it got broke up. Nothing really happened. Then we started again. Then it got broke up again. And that story has been repeated a hundred times. And I've heard it where somebody would say, yeah, Steve Kern come in there and punch Coco while he was naked in the shower. And then Coco come out of the shower and beat the dog shit out of him. And I'm, wait a minute. That ain't how it happened. And that's not what happened. Neither one of us won that fight because it wasn't a real fight to me. And this is just an opinion again. But to me, when you get into a fight, if you're looking for a winner and a loser, if there's a loser, somebody should be bleeding. Somebody should be down on the ground trying to quit. Somebody should be 
overwhelmed. But when it just is a scuffle where you just kind of get at it and get pulled apart and you get at it again, you get pulled apart, it's not really a fight. And I'm you know, I'm sure Dutch would back it up because I heard Dutch tell the story. The only thing Dutch had wrong when he told the story on a podcast was he said, Stan and I didn't go to Jonesboro, which was a Saturday night town in Nashville. We just drove to Nashville. Well, that's not true because we were booked in Nashville because in those days, you didn't just not go to the town. If you're the main event, you surely didn't just go to the town and all of a sudden now you're you're basically um, skipping a town to come cause a problem. That's not how it happened. So that's the only thing that I questioned when Dutch told the story, but that's only because it's so old. You know, he talked about it and said, yeah, they just, you know, Dutch knew what a real fight was. I, I, said, I, I like yeah. in the book that you said also that um, of the entire scene of people breaking up and then Ricky Morton was just running around like a screaming like a girl in the locker room. I thought that was a funny line. You know, I, I, you know, another thing is, is when, when something like that happens, you really start to see, you look around and you see who the, who the real men are and who, you know, like understands and like Dutch, I mean, and Dutch is a real man. He's helped, he's trying to break it up. So three more, but Ricky Morton's screaming and crying and he was causing more of a, um, you know, confusion than anybody. And oh no, we can't do this. And oh my God, oh no. And I'm going like, really? Come on, man. We're having an argument. Got out of hand. That's all it is. I mean, I didn't pull out a knife and cut Coco from ear to ear, and Coco didn't shoot me in the leg. I mean, I did shoot Barry Windham in the leg, but he didn't shoot me in the leg. And so I can't you know, let that one go. You shot Barry Windham in the leg. Yeah, I shot it. Well, it was an accident, but I shot him in the <laughs> thigh. I, I shot him in the thigh with a, I had a nine millimeter pistol and we pulled over on the side of the road and I started shooting at signs and Barry was standing beside me and I, I was hitting this speed sign and we were way out in the middle of the state of Florida and all of a sudden Barry rolls down the embankment we we're standing on and I'm, I look over at him and said, just why? He said, you just shot me. I go, there's no way I shot you. I'm shooting at that sign. I thought maybe the ejection from the bullet was hot and came out and hit him in the leg because he had his shorts on. But what it did was the bullet ricocheted out of the sign, came back, and it lodged in his thigh. And so, you know, we dug it out. It was just barely in him. We dug it out. He wrapped the bandana around it, and that's the end of it. But Barry tells that same story, and he said that I got out of the car and shot him getting out of the car because I didn't have the gun on safety. And that, again, that ain't true. I mean, you know, when something like that happens, you'll remember if you just shot somebody because you didn't have the gun on safety or if you're just shooting and a bullet ricocheted back into them. So that's how stories go around. That's how they get changed. Well, but. Barry told me. Now, I'm going to mess up two different stories here. He told me that he was the king of either shooting road signs while driving or throwing beer bottles at road signs and hitting them while driving. No, uh, he was good at both. Um, I would say I was a better shot with a gun than he was. I, you know, I'm not going to tap out or surrender to anybody. I could shoot stuff out the window. I mean, you know, and I had made the mistake of doing something stupid. One time I pulled the trigger inside the car. I got so excited about shooting a, a hog that was on the side of the road. I shot a hole through my dash of my car and killed my radio. But... <clears throat> Barry was awesome and he had them long arms and he liked to throw them over the roof because he always liked to drive. So he would he would have a little bit more of, you know, an obstacle to get over to get his, but he was good at throwing <laughs> beer bottles. Uh, okay, and we're back. Sorry, we had a bit of a break there, but we are back. Uh, Steve has kindly said we've got a little bit more time, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions. Then we're going to go into our... Uh, main event as it were and one thing uh, I mean we're not even going to talk about Ken Patera. I'd love to talk about Ken Patera, but uh, we'll uh, leave him there because one of the things I really want to talk to you about are your initial struggles with working with the Road Warriors when they came to Memphis was my original then uh, was that was the first time you wrestled the Road Warriors was in Memphis wasn't it yeah it, was. <clears throat> it wasn't a struggle um, it was a change. 
And the reason it was a change is because they were young and inexperienced. And I mean, you know, they had this concept in their mind of what they were and didn't matter what anybody else was. They were going to get their gimmick over and do it, which was understandable. But <clears throat> they came to a territory where Stan and I were the guys. I mean, you know, we were the people, we were the tag team that was on the top of the you know, the latter at the time and, you know, it was a combination of us and them meeting the first time and, you know, working with them. It took me a second to figure them out, <clears throat> but they weren't the, <clears throat> excuse me, what they weren't the first big guys that I'd worked with that didn't really sell that well. They, I was used to that. I mean, you know, and so I, I had tricks and it was an experienced veteran working with guys less experienced and knowing how to handle it. And like when I took Hawk's arm the first time and twisted it, he just looked down his arm at me and stuck his dog up. <laughs> and I'm going, well, I guess that's not working. So I figured it out and take them down, take them down, take their leg. And once you get them on the ground, that's hard to get up, you know, and you just keep them down there and then you'll get your, baby face, whatever, over, and then when it's time for the heat, just sell for them and make a comeback and move them around. But I didn't have any problem with them that night. The very first time, we got along okay. We did have to make some adjustments, Stan and I, from what we had been doing, more entertainment-style wrestling in Tennessee to get a little bit more serious with them, more grappling and a little bit more, you know, slug fist kind of stuff but just going toe to toe with them and things. And, you know, it's just like, it took some adapt. It wasn't until later on in the AWA, I had my first kind of like, um, you know, difference with them that kind of caught me off guard, but I turned it around and it ended up being better than what was planned. And then in Puerto Rico, it happened again and kind of had to really dig deep to outsmart them this time, but it worked out all right. And so, they got over it. It was always Hawk. It wasn't Joe. Joe was easy to get along with, but Hawk was kind of a hothead, and he had this misconception of what, what he was doing sometimes. And even when we didn't seem like we were getting along, we still respected each other. And after he'd cool off, like sometimes it took a couple months for him to cool off, but after he'd cool off, he'd start laughing about it. And he, and he put me over. He said, well, you're smarter than most guys I work with. He said, you know, usually just manhandle them and they just get over it. But you have a way of working me. You know, you're nice to me in the dressing room. And then when you get me out there, you'll take me to school. And I go, it's, it's not purposely. It's that I know you're not being a businessman. And here's the deal. This is not real. This is predetermined. We're doing the best we can to emulate a fight but neither one of us is really trying to hurt each other but i need to i need to look good too and i'm not going to let you just dominate me and so he respected me for that but he always threatened me <laughs> <laughs> did uh did you ever get a win over the road warriors yeah several times in the awa and the reason was is we were building things well we we got we were supposed to get a win the first night, but they came to the ring and said they weren't doing it. And so, you know, I'm going like, what? Anyway, that was a mistake. I, I'm saying what when he's going, we're not doing what Vern Gagne wants. We're doing it our way and nobody gets hurt. And I'm looking at what? And that's, I didn't mean what, like a smart aleck. Like I meant like, what? I never heard this before. And the next thing I know, I was fighting for my life. But. You know, I worked out all right. I outsmarted them. And the the finish was supposed to be Stan and I would do a notorious switch of talent on a double knockdown. Somebody go down, other guy go down. Heel comes in to feed. Referee's putting the heel out. I'd slide Stan out or he'd slide me out, roll in like he was me or I was him. And when the guy come to pick us up, we just inside cradle one, two, three real quick and roll out like a steal it. But, you know, didn't want to do that. And so that would have gotten us over pretty good. But the way we did it and the way it ended up, I mean, you know, I just got to a point where I was frustrated because he was just 
wanted heat, 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 heat on me. And I spent enough time over his head that day to get a pilot's license and press <laughs> slam. And I said, you know, it's like, okay, I tag Stan and he let Stan have a little bit of a comeback and then try to ground him. And then I just said, you know what? We need to get this over with. And I rolled out, grabbed a chair and came in shooting with a chair. And I mean, I wasn't going to let nobody take the chair away. <laughs> and I was really hitting him. And or, um, Paul Ellering's going, get out, get out. And he's going, no, nah, he wanted to kill me. But I was pretty stiff with the chair. And I was pretty stout at the time, too. So I was letting him <laughs> hold him. <laughs> and, the, and the crowd popped unreal. It was almost like it was better than any other way it could have happened. Because it, it looked like we'd just gotten beat to the point where we weren't going to take it anymore. And we stood up and just went fighting them as best we could. And ended up running them off. And so I so said, that worked out good, but I don't ever want to get back in the ring with them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I do not blame you. I'll ask you one more question, and then we'll go to the little finale we've got going. Then I'll thank you so much for your time. We'll do some uh, plugs for the books as well. But uh, we were just talking off air recently before we said, someone my age will talk to you, and they'll begin their questions at Skinner. I'm going to end my uh, main question career thing on Skinner because when I was a kid, sure. uh, I started watching 93. And one of my brother's older brother's friends, he furnished me with a bunch of uh, videotapes from 91 and 92. And a lot of the videotapes had Skinner on it. And let me tell you, as a six, seven year old watching that, you were one of the more scary characters to me. And one of the things I also didn't understand was I'd never heard or seen dipping tobacco. So I was wondering always why you always had marmalade in your mouth and you were sort of like biting, you know, you were biting people and getting marmalade on them. So it, it, someone had to explain that to me. I'm very good. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, the, but the Skinner character, I mean, talking to you now, it sort of makes more sense because you were happy capturing armadillos with a towel. It's not that big of a, not that big of a stretch to, uh, I suppose, skin some alligators. There's only a couple of steps forward. But who came to you first with the character or was this something that you came to the WWF with? I'll try to condense it because it's kind of a long story. But the simple thing was, is it was a big transitional period at the time in the early 90s. And all my friends had gone to the WWF. And I was in that situation where I was in kind of in limbo, not really sure what to do. And so I, t I, I got I saw Jimmy Hart here in Tampa. Pausing. Did you stop me? No, sorry, uh, your screen's... Uh, I'll just pause again. Right, okay, hello everyone. Uh, it turns out that uh, I have Virgin Media and it's been in the news all day that Virgin Media broadband services are going down and I'm really unhappy that we didn't get to hear the rest of that story. Uh, we're going to have Steve Kern on, hopefully, Dutch Mantel's show in a few weeks. Depends on Steve, we're going to sell some more books for him. Uh, Steve really wanted to say, uh, once again, the Kern Chronicles Volume 1 is available from Amazon. And also, there'll be additional links if you don't want to buy through Amazon to buy his book. But, oh, hang on. It says I'm the host now. One sec. Steve's back on. Okay, no, uh, the internet's not working. Uh, that's unbelievably annoying because I had a ton of more questions. Well, we're going to go to about two hours we'd agreed to, and we've made it to about one hour 40 with the internet down. Anyway, so uh, Steve's already said that he uh, would like to come on the Dutch show, so that would be good. We'll do that when my internet's working. And my internet needs to work in an hour because I'm recording two, epi uh, not two episodes, one massive episode of Storytime with Dutch about WrestleMania. So uh, that's uh, to come, but it sounds like I'm going to have to go to someone else's house and record it there. So anyway, thank you for watching. Steve will be on the Dutch show, hopefully to tell more stories as well. But for now, thank you for watching and we'll catch you again uh, when I next have a guest.